every year, Britain relies on ships for a foreign trade worth 7,000 million pounds. Aircraft could carry perhaps a hundredth part of it. Oceans cover three quarters of the Earth's surface, and without ships, Britain would starve to death in 14 days. In times of peace, the merchant vessels combat natural hazards. In times of war, they are the prime targets of the enemy. The Royal Navy's major task is to protect the merchant vessels and the shipping lanes. In times of war, it fights. In times of peace, it trains to fight. The Defence Ministry in London is the nerve centre of the Navy. It's a magnet that attracts signals from every continent. Ships, attaches and agents supply the reports, analyses and intelligence on which is based the strategic deployment of the fleet. From its operations room and others like it on overseas bases, the movements of 400 ships and 100,000 men are controlled. At this moment, at any moment, the Navy's ships encompass the globe from the Arctic Ocean to the Ross Sea. At this moment, it's 1400 Zulu in Navy time, two o'clock in the afternoon in Whitehall. North of Bermuda, it's 10 a.m. as a guided missile destroyer heads west-nor-west to rendezvous with a tanker. 3,000 miles east, near Gibraltar, at 1400, an aircraft carrier prepares a division of buccaneers, their air crews already being briefed on a low-level strike in support of a Royal Marines exercise. A further 5,000 miles eastward, it's early evening off Singapore, where a cruiser's attack radar scans for the echoes that will be her towed target slipping into position 12 miles downrange. It's 1400 Zulu in the North Sea, where a coastal minesweeper rolls on for her fifth sweep of the day over a World War II minefield. The mines should, by now, be harmless, but for the safety of the world shipping, they are still being destroyed. It's mid-afternoon southeast of Malta, and a commando ship will soon be disembarking vehicles, weapons and men for a tactical training ground in the Mediterranean. This will be her last exercise before she sails through the Suez Canal for the Far East Station. It's 5 p.m. off Aden, where a frigate and her consort are hunting. Somewhere in the vastness of their exercise area is a submerged submarine. The frigate's job to seek, locate, destroy. It's a job that involves some 550 men, modern electronics, higher mathematics, and old-fashioned luck. 12 knots up. Revolutions 9-6. Impulses sent out from the sonar control room bounce back from submarines and from cold water layers, shoals of fish and large lumps of seaweed. Modern, still secret equipment is more selective, but it still relies on the operators for positive identification. Their initial training takes months, perfecting the technique takes years. It's training for the submarine too, a chance to perfect the knife edge balance between evasion and destruction. Four twenty, steer ahead together. Steer three three zero. Up. Bring all bow tubes to the action state. north of Bermuda, the guided missile destroyer comes in astern of the tanker for refueling. In a nuclear age, 
the Navy accepts the destruction of its ports and shore facilities, and the replenishment fleet can keep ships totally independent of shore installations for weeks, even months at a time. Ships of the Royal Fleet Auxiliary operate under an illogical system which is uniquely British, for they are manned by merchant navy personnel who fly the Blue Ensign and hold Union cards. It's to their credit that no operation has ever been delayed through shortage of stores, ammunition or oil. And 600 marines in a political hotspot may need the backing of 5,000 men and a dozen ships. All of them, carriers, destroyers, landing craft and frigates, work to a program that's timed to the last second. Sixty minutes from zero hour, three miles off the coast. Marine frogmen of the special boat section start work. Their job, the destruction of underwater obstacles to clear the approaches for the landing craft. Minus 35, engine start-up time for the Buccaneers. Zero minus 30. The LCAs with their marine assault troops are slipped from the commando ship. They are timed to hit the beach as soon as the underwater obstacles are destroyed. Minus 25. In the carrier, the first entries are made on the operations board. 1435-19, clear taxi.
Directed from the carrier, the Buccaneers' targets are bridges, fuel and ammo dumps, supply columns, anything that will delay the enemy's reinforcements. Minus 15. Acid is dissolving copper discs in the demolition charge detonators as the special boat section is snatched back. Ten minutes to zero hour. The helicopters load up with the troops who will be dropped in as soon as the landing zone is clear. The LCAs hit the beach. In war, they would be supported by the combined firepower of the task force and fixed wing aircraft.
helicopters have changed the tactics of war. They drop men into desert and jungle and keep them supplied with weapons and ammunition. Now they become a ground support weapon in their own right. southeast is another sea and an unfinished exercise. The frigates have been torpedoed twice. Now they come in again to the attack. Zero. Speed 18 knots. Over. Port 20. Port 20, sir. Twenty four. Well, sir. Revolutions 146. Well, sir. Well, sir. The frigate's sonar pings out supersonic transmissions. The submarine's steel hull reflects them back to be picked up, measured, and plotted. Action mortar. Two six is coming right, sir. Two nine zero. Engage of mortars, SC controlling. Engage of mortars, SC controlling. Build the packets high. The submarine's evasion tactics are too late. The mortars are locked electronically to their target. Now they will follow it like a shadow, making automatic allowances for roll and pitch and changes in depth, speed and direction. They fire only when they know they're within killing range. That's it. Fire the smoke, Campbell. In times of peace, an anti-submarine frigate doesn't kill its target. From the position of the floating projectile to the submarine smoke candle, you can tell if you've scored a bull. Mines reflect the ingenuity of the military engineer, for they may be triggered by contact, magnetism, noise, or even a shadow. But the sweepers, with their wooden hulls, and secret electronic equipment can find and deal with most of them. The mines can be exploded by towed wires, by sound waves, or by electrical impulses from the sweeper's own generators. Off Singapore, the cruiser's radar has found her target. The last of the conventionally armed warships, the modern cruisers have weapons of fantastic accuracy and firepower. Her six-inch guns can fire 20 shells a minute from each barrel. Her three inches fire like a heavy machine gun. Her computers allow for speed, wind, range, temperature, even rotation of the Earth.
soon the cruisers will cease fire forever as a new class takes over. The guided missile destroyer has a performance and firepower as advanced as the first ironclad warship was over the wooden hull. Her steam engines are boosted by gas turbines for high speed and instant readiness. She can be conned completely from below decks. She can pass harmlessly through nuclear fallout because her pre-wetting system prevents contamination. Computers and transistors are the heart of the modern Navy, but a battle could be lost through a loose connection. The sailor of today needs to know more about electronics than hoisting mainsails. The guided missile destroyer's living accommodation is air-conditioned and just about as spacious and comfortable as you can get on a ship which was primarily designed as a floating weapon system. Hands to action stations. Hands to action stations. Bridge, this is PCR. Captain is requested to come to the officer. Over. The guided missile destroyer's role is anti-aircraft and anti-submarine task force defense. Should aircraft penetrate her distant defense, she is equipped with SeaCats, beam riding missiles of wicked accuracy. defense is the sea slug, a supersonic rocket boosted missile. Sea slug aircraft. Sea slug aircraft. Slug's performance is secret, but its guidance system is such that on trials it has scored a bullseye every time. MDOM target on uh, this bogey, about to pass this way. Roger, the fight is going to pass the coast there. Beetle boy. Nothing is permanent in the field of defense. The more recent ships have gas turbines for instant readiness and to boost their already high speeds. Most of the modern ships carry helicopters which have their own dipping sonar to find submarines, their own homing torpedoes to kill them. Even the smallest frigate has its wasp, an anti-submarine weapon in its own right. 
The latest anti-submarine weapon is itself a submarine, the hunter-killer nuclear-powered monsters that only need refueling every five years. They are so fast that they bank when turning, dive so deep that a crash program of seabed charting had to be completed for them. They can circumnavigate the world underwater and their submerged time is only limited by the endurance of their crews. Tactical changes and weapon advances need continuous development programs. This was the first landing of a VTOL aircraft on a carrier anywhere in the world. Vertical takeoff and landing aircraft continue to be evaluated. Buccaneer has been developed into a faster, longer-ranged aircraft complementary to the Phantom. The Navy's missiles will include Polaris, a submarine-launched weapon with an intercontinental range. The development goes on. Weapon systems, propulsion units, strategy and tactics are changing year by year, for the Navy is ready round the world round the clock. Day and night, from the equator to the polar regions, at a thousand feet below sea level and 50,000 above, the Navy exercises, develops and trains. Trains for national security. Trains for worldwide emergency. Trains for the battles that may never come because of the deterrent value of the Royal Navy.